Good evening, I'm Norman Robinson, and welcome again to NOLA Crime Crisis. This evening, we continue our conversation discussing what needs to be done to decrease the amount of crime in our city. And joining me this evening on this program, we are fortunate to have the former superintendent of the New Orleans Police Department, as well as the former council member, Arnie Fieldco, of course the former uh, police superintendent is Ronald Surpass, now a professor at the uh, University Loyola. of uh, Loyola. And um, of course, Mr. Arnie Fieldco is um, well known to all of us here and is a civic member who's very active in our community, um, handling things that will improve the lives of, of regular people in the city of New Orleans. Tell us what you're doing. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Norman. It's an honor to be with you and with the chief and uh, to be talking about this most crucial topic we're going to deal with today. Uh, I'm the, I've, I'm, for the last five years, I've been the CEO of the Jewish Federation of mm -hmm. Greater New Orleans. Um, I'm actually retiring from that position at the end of the calendar year. Uh, it has been an absolute joy to, to work with the community at large in New Orleans, the Jewish community. This is the greatest city in America, which is why, you know, we call it home. We came back, and it's been a, a pleasure to to have worked uh, with so many people to make this community better. And of course, you're doing your job of trying to uh, improve the um, the minds of the students at uh, at uh, Loyola University. You're a professor there, and you have been for the past nine years. Yes, it's been nine years since I left the NOPD, and at Loyola, mm -hmm. we're one of the oldest criminal justice programs in the country. Started in the 1970s during the Leap Era, which was a government-sponsored way of creating education opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, but I got to say this, you know, one, it's great to see you, Norman. I, I remember <laughs> we would do the hot seat, and I'd make yes. you laugh, and we'd have to cut <laughs> and start all over again. And I've, I've never had a chance to say this to Arnie yet, but I was police chief in Nashville when Arnie was elected to the at-large position. And because I am a New Orleans family and somebody in my family has been on the NOPD unbroken since 1914, to this wow. day, it's always been important to me. And I just always wanted to tell you that the beacon of light you sent out of New Orleans after Katrina was one of the reasons that attracted me to want to come back home. Well, that's very nice of you to say, Chief. It's very Thank true. you so much. It's I very appreciate true. it. Now, let me put both of you on, on the hot <laughs> seat. Um, we're not comfortable with where we are as a city right now. It's a great city. Uh, do you feel safe in no. New Orleans? No. No. It's impossible to feel safe when people look at one another and they talk about their friends who have been hurt. They talk about their friends whose cars have been broken into. The, the, the problem with crime stats and crime data, Norman, is it always lags people's perceptions. So if we are just being told last week that this is a crisis, it's been a crisis in the mind of the people a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. And it's just unfortunate that one of the greatest old American cities is essentially falling into a condition that's very hard to dig back out of. Do you feel safe, Mr. Fieldco? No, same, same sentiment. It's, um, candidly, it's a shame because this is the greatest city that I've ever lived in. I think it's the greatest city in America. People that come here fall in love with it and don't want to leave. But there comes a point um, when, you know, family overtakes love for community. And when you feel that your, your kids, your wife, uh, your mother, your father are not safe in a city, and that's where we are now, unfortunately, um, people are, you know, are, are sending the message by loading up and getting out of town. We can't afford that. We can't afford it literally from an economic standpoint. We can't afford it from a perception standpoint. And we've got to change this, and we've got to change it pretty rapidly. So where, where do we go from here, Mr. Surpass? I grew up in an era of politicians who didn't find the solution to every problem as to blame someone else. And right now we have a political class of many people in New Orleans who I've been part of this, right? I've been on the other side getting the hot questions from you. So I think it's fair to say, I think we're part of a group of people now who look for everybody else to blame. You know, Mitch and I might have had disagreements. You might have had disagreements with Mark. I might have had disagreements with Mayor Purcell or Mayor Dean or Governor Locke. None of those people look for somebody to blame. We just recently saw an effort to blame the current policing crisis that's been going on for four years on the judge. This We're, is the consent decree. The consent decree. I mean, what a dichotomous thing to say in your outside vacation voice. 
Consent decrees were built to enhance constitutional policing, safety for the community, and safety for the officers. And to literally find that as a way to blame, right? Here's the question I would just ask. A policy of a city is best example, uh, exemplified in its budget, right? That's, that's where you, the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. Who on the council was voting for all the budgets that Mayor Landrieu submitted that froze police recruitment retention? Who voted for the budgets that Mayor Cantrell submitted that froze recruitment and retention as a priority? You're talking about where it starts. Where it ends, it's the council that has the authority. The mayor can say all the things they want to say. Mm -hmm. The council has to approve that budget. And look, they have a tough job. Children to feed, potholes to fix. But at the end of the day, Mayor Cantrell's budget has been approved by that council every year. So it's not just her that needs to be thinking about this out loud and being asked questions. So where do we go, Mr. Phil Cole, from a civic perspective? Sure. Well, I, I think the first, you know, the first topic, as whenever, whenever one faces a challenge, you've got to acknowledge and admit that there's a problem. I would like to believe over the last few weeks in particular, I've seen a shift in that, both from our mayor, from our, you know, I think the city council for the last several months has been pretty much on top of this being in a, uh, the priority of our community right now. But I think everybody's getting it. The new coalition that was formed, I mean, 260 members, uh, organizations, that's quite a, you know, quite a message being sent. So I, first thing is, you know, I think we all are aware this is topic number one one and it's going to be for a while then the second thing is what, are, what what's our plan what specifically can we do to make the city safer you know uh, council has a role mayor has a role the NOPD has a role every element of the criminal justice system has a role I think that we have the formation of a plan all right I think the council put out in my opinion a pretty good you know 10-step plan of things that we could do that are tangible and concrete that being well, it starts with obviously the NOPD. We we all know that it's not the long term answer, but we we got to get more numbers here. Okay, I mean whether the number is 900 or 800, and it's probably lower than that in terms of um, actual officers on the street. On the street, mm -hmm. um, we know we've got it. We we've got to build that number back up. Okay. How do you do that? What incentives can we create? The council's created some financial incentives through ordinance that'll be helpful. You know, chief knows this better than me, but some of the things about taking tests and all of that and having to be in the city, people are realizing, well, maybe there's another way to do it. So, you know, they put their plan talks about civilian help, priority to where we put our police officers, um, but it's not all NOPD. I mean, it's, it's again, if we're going to talk short term, Term, it's the justice system in general. If we're going to talk really long term, I mean, then we got to set, sit and talk about education. We got to talk about opportunities, recreation, jobs, things like that. That right now people maybe don't want to focus on because they're more concerned yeah. about the short term. Well, let's triage this thing. You know, first steps first. First things first. What do we do first? Well, in my opinion, the first thing, if there was one thing we have to do right now, it has to be on recruitment and retention of our NOPD. Um, you know, we are at, um, at very low numbers, okay? And, and, you know, from at least listening to experts like the, like the chief and others in the field, I mean, we, we really can't continue to operate at the numbers we want to do, all right? We shouldn't have to have the mayor put out a statement like she did yesterday that Mardi Gras could be in jeopardy because we don't have the police force. What right. did you think of that, that statement, um, uh, Mr. Surpass? When you heard the mayor say that Mardi Gras, she might cancel Mardi Gras if there aren't enough police. I don't think it's very responsible. I don't think it's very well thought out. Mardi Gras is the is the, the, the jewel of the crown of the city of New Orleans in so many ways. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that you threaten people with the end of something that is, you know, hundreds of years in the making because of something that's been brewing here for a few years, right? To the question of what can we do immediately, that there's only, there's only, this is really important, there's only one scientifically proven method of policing that reduces crime, and it's proactive policing. When you let the numbers drop, as Arnie's talking about, when you get down to like 950 people in a department this size, you have no time except to be reactive, which is answering the radio. Reactive means it's already happened, you're late, it's done. Exactly. When you can be staffed so that you can be proactive, 
you can bring murders down like we did in the 90s. You can bring murders like we did in the early 2010s. You can bring violent crime. Another study just released this week, proactive policing, constitutionally done, reduces crime, and it doesn't just move it to neighborhoods. It has a dissipating effect. So what the unfortunate reality of the NOPD has become this, by the continued siphoning off of staffing, re recruitment, and retention since 2011 and 12 and therefore, Chief Ferguson has no extra people on the field, right? Uh, Arnie's a tremendous sports expert. Sean is playing football with five players against a team with 11. And, he and he's outgunned. He can't be proactive, he can't say. So what the first thing you have to do I've been involved in a lot of criminal justice reform. There's a lot of things that I believe have changed since the 90s and the 80s and 2000s. But the two things we've got to remember about criminal justice reform is one, victims should always be our first concern. And secondly, the criminal justice system, 4th, 5th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendment is built for defendants to protect themselves. But we have the police footprint in so many parts of people's lives that have nothing to do with policing that takes time, resources, and people. So I agree with liberal political ideology that says let's reduce the footprint of policing to reduce the criminal justice footprint on young people. I totally get that. And by the way, free up those cops to go chase the very dangerous people who we still know from science and experience works. Let me ask you this question because I've, I've talked to some policemen who agree with the mayor that the consent decree has hampered them in their their jobs uh, as police officers because there's there's so much administrative um, bureaucratic uh, hoops that they have to jump through is it the consent decree or is it the way the consent decree is being implemented it's not the decree execution is the issue uh, we all fly, we, we fly in planes every day. You think mm -hmm. pilots like doing all the stuff they're supposed to do before they take the plane off? Mm -hmm. But they do it because it's those, it's those basic principles that have to be followed. I refuse to believe and have refused to believe from the beginning that a consent decree makes a city unsafe and makes police officers unhappy. Mm -hmm. Execution can be an issue. And how are you actually bringing together? Now, you know, until just a few months ago, we were getting a lot of positive reviews about the consent decree and police officers yes. were doing well. Mm -hmm. Final point. And, and uh, Arnie would have heard more of this than me. In every large organization, there's going to be a group of people who, 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 who talk about how bad things are. That's natural. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the tenor of that is so much higher now that we probably should take a much harder look at how PIB is doing, the internal affairs process is being worked. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a losing hand politically to say to the community, we have to do too many of the right things to make you safe. And I think that's what the mayor's message was to the court, that doing all these right things isn't going to make people say, uh, that's a very weak hand to play. So that was, in your estimation, uh, a political blunder on, on her part? I'm not a politician, but I know that to tell people that we're going to do less of the right things because that's going to make you safer is, a, is dead on arrival. Mm. And the court certainly made that opinion clear on Wednesday. And, oh, by the way, yes. today's paper, the judge in Baltimore overseeing the Baltimore consent decree. Our, our good leader, Mike Harrison, is yes. the commissioner there. Mm -hmm. That judge said exactly, essentially the same thing. He said, quit blaming the consent decree mm -hmm. for y'all not doing the right thing. Yeah, Mike Harrison was the former police chief yeah. here Followed in, me. in New Orleans. He does a great, I, I think he's the, I think of the world of I mean. And You're, I think, I, I just have to say, I think we were all surprised. I think. You were surprised. I was surprised by, the, by this week's um, events. I think, like everyone else, I believe that we were moving towards the end of the consent decree, that we had fulfilled and checked off a number of the boxes, and the judge made it very clear on Wednesday, saying, uh, s slow the process down here, because actually we backtracked a little bit uh, by not having the resources that we need in New Orleans with our police force. Um, you know, we may have to go revisit some of these other areas. So I, it was kind of an awakening, I think, for everybody that's been following this. So you thought initially that, that the mayor had, was, was standing on solid ground when she, when she asked that the NOPD, uh, NOPD be released from the, the consent decree? Well, I don't have inside knowledge as to whether she was on solid ground or not, but the perception of the community is that over the last several months, we had made significant progress, or at least we appeared to have made significant progress. And Wednesday, um, the judge made it very clear that not so much, okay, that we still have a long way to go. Now, how long the decree is in place, we'll have to see. I mean, the same thing with the, um, with the sheriff, okay? Well, we have a consent decree, you know, with, with the sheriff as well. Yes. So, 
you Which know, I doesn't seem to be going very well. No, it does not. Does not. And you know, I think we're going to have to take a step back, all of us now. And the one thing I, I agree with the with the chief totally on: you can't use the consent decree as a reason for whether we're safe or not safe. Okay, it's just one more tool that was put in place some years ago to try to make our police department better. Okay, more constitutional, more equitable, things like that. And again, I think what the judge is communicating is that because of the lack of staffing and resources, you know, we're going to need to, you know, go back and look at some of the items again. I wish I'd said that. Because that was perfect. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, the judge said, wait a minute. You're asking me to say no. I mean, you're asking me to say you can go. You just had a paid detail scandal. You got crime going through the roof. You got people dropping off the police department as fast as they can get to the front door. What do you mean? And it, it, it was it was not I don't think it was well played on behalf of the citizens and that's who it should all be played for. We we we're talking a lot about perception. And the perception of the general public is that um, our our police officers are are just in dire straits. We took cameras to the streets to talk to some of them and here's some of the things that they had to say and, and I think that they probably agree with you guys. Pretty much it. We just need more manpower. That's the only thing. I see that stopping it because you know they never started talking about the shortage until you know the past two years. Are they gonna have to pay the police? Give them good, give them good pay where, they, where you get good offices, and um, that way they want to stay, you know. And uh, other other parishes are paying a lot more money, and I mean, let's be honest, your, your life is a lot less dangerous over there with enough offices, and you're making more money than you know over here with uh, not enough offices, and they're not paying anything. So then you got to work details, and then they're cracking down on them with that. So I don't know. Other than paying the office, I don't know what they're going to do. I heard two things in those interviews that stood out to me. One was, then start talking about the crisis until you know two years after the crisis, and secondly, you're not being, uh, you're not paying the police enough, and they're going other places. What's your reaction? The crisis has been brewing for quite a while, right? The city of New Orleans started to see increases in crimes in uh, 2019, violent crimes, mm -hmm. COVID for a period of time, but COVID doesn't explain all this, right? And if you look at the data around the country, there was a period of time when a lot of people kind of stayed inside, including criminals. But that changed about June or July of that year. So that this guy, he, he's on it. He's living in the neighborhood. He saw it. I learned a long time ago in graduate school, and uh, those who, who are listening to us who've run businesses, money is a demotivator, but it's not at the top of the list, right? There's a lot okay. of other things that demotivate people, but when money is way out of whole sorts, it can be at the top of the list. So I would say that to say this, New Orleans has a very sound structure of pay that's very competitive with the rest of the state. But something is inherently changing in the way the officers are talking about the department among themselves and their friends, barbecues, grocery stores. In my experience in three different states, you go to military bases, you go to high schools, you go on the internet, you do all those really good things, but what drives recruitment ideas and success is the way people are talking about the department among their friends. And I don't I know all the reasons why, but I think it's clear that peop, there's been a break. In the last six to 12 months, there's just been a break in the communications among the officers, and it's, it's like, okay, we're done. This community organization that was formed by the business and civic leaders, are you talking to police officers? Are you, are, are you listening to what they're saying? And are you coming up with any kind of strategy that would address their concerns? Sure. Well, first of all, kudos to uh, Michael Hecht and GNO Inc. and their leadership for taking the lead on this in a really quick fashion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we once I heard about this coalition, my organization, the, the Jewish Federation, we signed on immediately and, and, and said, our, whatever we can do, we're here to help. Um, they, they've been smart about how they're approaching this. Number one, they, they want to raise some money. They, their goal is to raise $15 million. They're well on their way, even in over three years, they're well on their way in the first year to meeting those goals. Second is, they said, we got to break down both the short term and the long term. Mm -hmm. The long term is a much harder fix here. I mean, as you know, and yes. the chief knows, I mean, look, public education is a big problem. 
It's got better over the years, no doubt about it. It's got better, but is it where it needs to be? No. All right, recreational opportunities. I mean, things that, I just came back from Wisconsin, which is where I was born and raised. Every school you go to has great facilities, football fields, you know, tennis courts. Every course, school. Every school, not, and you go to New Orleans, and I know we're landlocked, and I know, but we have to commit and make this a priority. I mean, when I was on the council, that was my chief area, is trying to build up recreation here, and, and still doing it, even today. We're hoping mm -hmm. to build a stadium in the Ninth Ward very soon. Um, but then they, they, they said, but the long term is gonna take a longer term. What do we do in the meantime, before we lose everybody in New Orleans? And their focus really is on the immediate stuff. And, talking to the police, trying to feel why people are leaving, how would you um, encourage people to join the NOPD versus other opportunities? Those are all part of the short-term answer that uh, we've got to fix. And, you know, money, yeah, money's part of it to, uh, in any job, okay? But I think we, New Orleans has a lot to sell, you know, in addition to the money. We just got to make sure that the police feel good about working with NOPD. Well, that's the sense that I'm getting from, from the officers that I've talked to that is not a matter of money it's a matter of the conditions that they're working under is that what you're hearing absolutely and I think if you had to pick a moment in time when the officers uh, could have turned and the way they feel internally you remember a couple years ago uh, the police foundation and the zoo were gonna have a night of celebration yes for the police yes a few emails from some people in New York they killed it they canceled it Two days later, the zoo said, oh, we're going to do it now. This is the universal comment I got from the police. How can we trust anybody here? The zoo's paid with taxes. The zoo's paid with fare, people coming through the gates. And they couldn't stand with us to have a celebration for the work we're doing, and then only backed into it because they got pressured. I think that was a seminal moment in the minds of a lot of officers mm -hmm. who were out there by themselves between Reed and the industrial canal at two o'clock in the morning with nobody else working and the zoo couldn't support us mm -hmm. because some people in another part of the country were saying we should hate the police and we shouldn't support the police norman i've been a cop all my life mm -hmm. i never saw anything as despicable as that and i think that was one of the turning moments where cops were like okay okay we get it so you have you have a morale problem how do you fix that as a civic leader? You're not a police officer. You don't have a background in law enforcement. Right. How do you as a civic leader, an outsider, fix a morale problem in a law enforcement agency? Well, th there's a lot of ways. I mean, first of all, use of two simple words, thank you, goes a long way. When you see a police officer in the city and they're on your street or they're doing something at an event, walk up to them and just say thank you. I do that a lot because I really do appreciate the work. Um, I think we, we have to be able to do things like making sure they feel comfortable in their position. I know the mayor the last couple weeks has talked about the cars, okay? That maybe that's one way to boost some morale here, okay? To, to, to buy some newer cars for the, for the NOPD officers. But I just think it's making them feel appreciated that, you know, I think they hear the negatives a lot from the national media, from our local media at times. Well, the, the reality is, and Chief knows, it's the people, the people that are working on the ground, they're heroes, mm -hmm. especially today when you have such a, a limited workforce. So I think that's, that's a, a, a big thing that we can do is just civilians is support. I have to tell you, I'm politically, I'm, I've always been a liberal Democrat, okay? The defund the police effort was ridiculous, all right? And now you're seeing cities across America and liberal cities like San mm -hmm. Francisco and others. They're so reversing They're this. reversing yes. their, their, because look, yeah. you don't want to defund the police. What we need to be doing is supporting the police and supporting law enforcement so that you can have a, a solid criminal justice system that keeps us all safe. How much do you think that the, um, the, um, attitude of the general public um, by looking down their noses at the police department influence criminals to be more aggressive in no in no uncertain terms police study criminal behavior to try to interdict it criminals study police behavior and when the word gets out on the street that the police are either not enough or they're not engaged 
Of course Bob tells Bill, man, you know, Bob pulled that bird the other day. He ain't got picked off yet. Yeah, get it, please don't give a shit no more. Of mm -hmm. course they talk. The success that we had in 2013, bringing murder to a 28-year low with all the indictments of the gangs in the city of New Orleans and all that work, sent a message. It's a treatment. It sent a message to the people who wanted to be in the very dangerous game of guns that the government offered them a door of desistance, offered them social help if they wanted it. But if they didn't want it, they were going to get the full force of the local, state, and federal to interrupt their criminal behavior. That's just been released again as another successful scientifically proven method. Mm -hmm. But it takes people. So yes, Norman. These cops talk to one another, and they hear, the community hears, as well as the community that's wanting to commit crime. These numbers haven't changed yet. Three to five percent of any community is going to be criminal, like the Bible's been talking about for thousands of years. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. Mm -hmm. And about four to five percent of street segments are going to account for 50 percent of the crime. That's New Orleans. You have a very small number of people committing tremendous havoc in very identified places. So you, you approach policing on a person issue and a place issue. But if you don't have enough you know, offensive linemen, your quarterback can't make a play. If you don't have enough people, that's what's got to change. And I think the short-term solution is to realign with the council and the mayor's full support. It's the only way it's going to work. Realign what are they going to and then restaff based on what that's going to be. That'll give you some freedom right there. And I think, I think Arnie's absolutely right. Police officers are like soldiers. It matters to them what the general thinks. Mm -hmm. They might not ever see the general, but it matters to them what the senior leaders think. And one of the key issues in the Los Angeles, in the work that we found in one of the other cities, is that when the police officers didn't know which side of the issue, the mayor, the governor, and people were going to fall on any given day, it makes them decide, I'm not going to be an issue, because I don't know which way they're going to go. That's, it's all about leadership, right? It's, 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 it's all about, it's leadership. about leadership. That's what we're talking about now. Yeah, all that's right. a big motivator. Leadership changes morale quickly. We got 30 seconds, you get the last word. Well, I agree with what the chief said uh, on so many uh, levels. You know, look, I, we, we have a lot going for us as a community. I've said that, I, that's why I'm back here with my family. Um, we just need to make sure that this is a top, that this criminal justice issue is a top of mind issue, that it stays with us uh, for the time being until we get this thing fixed. And, uh, and we are gonna get it fixed. I've seen this before, you know, a decade ago when I was on council, we are gonna get it fixed. Yeah, well, we're counting on that. <laughs> we're counting on our leaders to get their act together. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate you taking your time to visit us here on NOLA Crime Crisis. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Norman. You're welcome. We would like to thank you this evening for joining us on NOLA Crime Crisis. We will be back next month with more city leaders, business owners, and other civic leaders looking to make a difference in our city. I'm Norman Robinson, and we will see you next time on NOLA Crime Crisis.